Hello, everybody. Welcome to see you, uh, to see you both <laughs> um, to the talk of uh, an open source SOC. Uh, so this will be mostly uh, about my personal experience of, of building SOCs with open source tools. Uh, of course, open source is uh, near and dear to, I think, uh, a lot of people in here. And, uh, well, probably or hopefully I can teach you something uh, about uh, the problems I faced or uh, the solutions I, I, I've chosen and, uh, and how it all works. So I want to keep this an open uh, session. So if at any point you, you feel like you want to ask something, please do. So make it interactive. You, you came here for knowledge and, and I'm trying to share what I can. So just uh, interrupt and, and ask away. So a little bit uh, about me for, for starters, uh, just to get an idea from what angle I'm approaching this. Uh, uh, well, I'm flexible, adaptive, creative, you know the things, messing around. MSX was my first PC. <laughs> so um, soldering the auto fire on joysticks and then from there on further to, uh, to hacking. Uh, patching all the console systems and uh, doing stuff like that. But anyway, I grew up and uh, started working in, uh, in, uh, as a network and system administrator, doing firewalls, VPNs, uh, stuff like that, designing, maintaining, and that's where I started building also uh, log collection and trying to trigger on certain events and then uh, realizing that you get a lot of events very quickly if you don't uh, configure that that good enough or, or aggregate not good enough. Um, so from there I started focusing more on security. I, I, I went into uh, uh, a security integrator and started working with a lot of customers who had already working systems, they needed extra network or security components and that's also where I started uh, the pen test uh, department and uh, well getting from all sides of angles to, to customers I, I was helping them with with making policies to translating policies into into um, uh, technical uh, measures to implement and uh, well uh, a seam was most of the time also part of that and uh, well, then you also are quickly also in a sock. So <laughs> that's uh, why I thought I, I might share here something uh, for you. All right. So when you walk away, I would like you to have an idea of uh, what a sock is exactly, because, uh, well, everybody has an, an idea for that. And then why uh, it is a problem to have a sock in a lot of companies also. Uh, especially small companies, you know, the budget is, is a problem, the budget for security is also a problem, and then for a SOC is even more a problem. So, um, then I would like to uh, show you the learnings of my open source journey for some of these uh, things, and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, probably you can help or see how to optimize your awareness for your company, for yourself, or for the SOC itself. So I want you to imagine what a SOC looks like. I think most of you have seen a SOC. Who has never seen a SOC or doesn't know what it is? Right? Okay. So imagine one right now, and most of the people are thinking something like this. So they think a lot of monitors. So if you say, I'm building a SOC, okay, do you have a lot of monitors? <laughs> because that's what people want to see. Well, actually, in none of the SOCs that I've built have these large uh, screens, not because they are not handy, but they are handy, uh, but they are also just actually a visual uh, thing. You can easily get this information on one screen or two or three instead of having this huge wall, but it's still a thing. This is what, uh, what, what the business thinks a SOC should look like. All right. It's not a system on a chip. <laughs> well, it's also a system on a chip. Um, <coughs> and it grew out of, it actually existed for quite some time, since the 70s. 
uh, and uh, it grew out of the th the network uh, operations center. That's what we, uh, well, what most people already had uh, in place, and uh, it's dealing with yeah, very working very closely with the organization. So what is the organization doing? Oh, we see a new rogue server. Oh no, that's our new intranet. So you need a lot of communication with what the business is doing. And then there are processes, the way things are done. Uh, are they? Can you can you find the change the management system? Can you find changes in your network and relate that? Well, and then you uh, also deal a lot with risks. So you you only monitor the things that you think are risky, because otherwise you're monitoring the, the wrong things. So that's a SOC. Uh, you have this this SOC in an ecosystem. If you're building a SOC, there might be a lot of things in place already, like a, a, a computer emergency response uh, team, uh, because emergencies are uh, likely to get more attention, or, or they were there before, or maybe you need to add it into your SOC. So there's an overlap of different functions within your organizations. Maybe your incident uh, response team is very capable, you have a good service desk, you can integrate into their incidents uh, when they have an incident. You use the same incident systems, for instance, but it could also be separate. So there's when you're building a SOC, you have to realize that there are uh, existing components and some are good and some are not, and you just take the best and maneuver that into your organization. All right, now on to the blueprint, uh, because I will not only focus on uh, an open source SOC, but also an open source small SOC uh, that could be easily run by, by one guy or two. But this is uh, ba the basic blueprint. This is the people working in a SOC. And if it's one person, you need to have these functions, so you need to put on different caps and say, OK, I'm going to do management. Management is going to communicate with your stakeholders, identify your stakeholders, and, uh, well, basically build the reports they want to see, build the right KPIs for your uh, progression into getting goals or setting goals even. And the analyst, of course, is doing the classical uh, threat intelligence. It's doing um, risk assessment, it's doing um, the monitoring, the, the identification, and uh, probably even resolving of, uh, of incidents. The engineer <coughs> is actually building everything you need to support that. So that could be procedures, that could be tools, that could be communications, relationships, anything that's required for the analyst to do the job, basically. And this is also uh, a rep representation of what I think, how much time you should spend uh, in each of these uh, tasks. So if you, if you have this and you know I'm one guy in IT, then you can spend this much time on solving incidents and the rest should be on building systems or designing or uh, improving or getting the communication out to your company. So these are the functions that that most socks have uh, and there are more and less parts in that or you can have additional functions or, or functions that you um, don't do but um, yeah these are the functions uh, of a sock basically so how to do open source uh, all these functions for instance, risk management. Does anybody have an idea? How do you do that in open source? No? Well, risk management is, is a, a kind of tricky because there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of uh, uh, tools out there. It's not very common for people to have different risk assessment systems. And apart from that, it's also known that, that it, well, we humans don't estimate risk uh, very well. Uh, the more people die of the flu than of uh, coronavirus, right? So 
<laughs> so far, yeah, that's right. So how do you do it? Well, you do it basically, you go to uh, the, uh, the ISO standard, for instance, of risk management. It says uh, pick any method to, uh, to inventorize your, your, your assets and your risks. So basically, you take a spreadsheet uh, in OpenOffice or LibreOffice, whatever, or, or maybe even Microsoft stuff, and then you brainstorm with experts what could happen with this part of the risk we're, we're uh, looking at. That is really the most easy way of getting the most risk management out of your, your tools. But if you, um, if you do need something, there's a tool that you can use. It's called Simple Risk. It's a VM. You can download it. It's a Docker or a web uh, application. Just download it. Don't expect the world of it. Just, just an, uh, a classification, basic classification system of uh, high, medium, low, or stuff like that. You can put your risks in, and you can say, I'm going to work on it. There's some residual risk left, or yeah, anything you that you can do for managing risks. But don't expect it to be a fully-fledged uh, risk management tool for you. You have to do that yourself, and it's an administration tool for you. Right? Is that, is that clear? Right. Vulnerability management, well, this will be no surprise, I think, to most, uh, most of us, because we're, uh, also like to, we also like to attack, right? So uh, you can manage your uh, vulnerabilities in several different ways. Just take open source tools you're comfortable with, or the team or your organization. If you, um, uh, well, you, you need to have something which covers everything, then I should, ta should suggest uh, OpenVOS. OpenVOS is uh, also a virtual machine, or you can implement it to build it yourself. Um, who doesn't know OpenVOS? Okay. Well, it basically is the fork of Nessus when it became uh, uh, professional or paid for a lot. <laughs> and uh, but I I must say, if you have a choice of uh, getting OpenVOS or Nessus Professional, I would say this is the one tool that you really need to to buy because OpenVOS does have a little uh, bit of a hiccup. It needs maintenance. You need to work on it. And uh, Nessus has dot that a lot less. So it's easily worth the money, I think, 2,000 euros or so per, per year. And there is an excellent open source tool provided by uh, a guy, I think, I think he might be here too. Uh, and he wrote uh, Secubus. Hi, Okay. I not using oh, right, yeah. Well, he's, he's an awesome guy making this available. What, what it basically does is everybody who hasn't done vulnerability scanning yet in there, or management more, I, I mean to say, because if you scan, you get a report, a list of this is, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. If you are going to manage that, then uh, it could be 5,000 issues you need to solve. And next week you're going to scan it, it's, it's 5,000 again. So you need to know what changed in this 5,000, because I, I made 5,000 requests to the to the team please solve it and next week i'm i'm there has anything been solved so you need to monitor that and this succubus does exactly that it it will make a change a diff of your two scanning moments all right furthermore for the seam uh, there are tools available for a seam they're not so abundant, I must say, but uh, if you, has anybody worked with Splunk, maybe? Yeah, because that's good, available. Well, Greylog is actually uh, more or less the same. It's also more or less the same compared to uh, the Elk stack. Does anybody use that? Right, okay. So it's, it's very com compatible. It's, it's almost the same. There are a few benefits to having Greylog because you can have um, Active Directory integration for your logins. You can have automatic uh, scanning of your uh, Tor exit notice of uh, anything else, bad actors you can have synchronized. And uh, for the rest, it's more or less the same. Um, still, I do like uh, the, the Greylog more. Uh, just for my based on my personal experience. 
Um, well, since it's a blueprint, let's uh, and SOC is almost synonymous in a lot of uh, talks to seem. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more about this one. Uh, so, for instance, getting your logs in might be a challenge. So I'm going to briefly give one sample of how that could be done. Um, in this particular case, I've chosen to uh, to not have any software installed on the Active Directory controller, which sometimes can happen. Uh, so what we do is we make a, a log collector machine, which uh, which has a Windows event forwarding. Uh, does anybody use that, Windows event forwarding? Okay, it's basically uh, a subscription model made by Microsoft and there's a lot of open source uh, documentation on how you can implement uh, this for your network. It basically uh, sends the events logs through to a collector server. Uh, then there, are, there could be a lot of software running on your machine which doesn't write to the event log. It creates files. So in this case you need something to read the files, uh, maintain the status and uh, check up on the file again and uh, re-import this data. So this is a sample of how that could be done with DNS and DHCP. And then it will import it into uh, Greylog and uh, just like Splunk, just like Elk, you can easily search it. All the fields are uh, automatically translated in the right format so you can search for it. Events log greater than event code this or smaller than event code that. Um, it differs from uh, commercial uh, seems in that it that it does not have any um, pre-built um, alerts set up for you, but they are not hard to find. For instance, uh, clearing your event log on a Windows machine is a pretty good indicator that there's something wrong or something fishy. So that's just an event number, and in gray log you say if this event number happens and it's not a scheduled event or other uh, parameters, then you can generate an alert. Um, another sample is, for instance, phishing. Phishing, I think a lot of people will agree with me, that's the number one reason uh, companies get hacked, because there's some email and uh, that's the first entry for most attackers into a company. So uh, how do you go about this? So this is, I think companies should really focus on this more. And to do that, you can, um, you can for, for instance, check the monitor and uh, install a cute little plugin. It's called uh, Microsoft Junk Mail Reporter. And this will create an extra button in your Outlook. People can click on it and your mail is automatically uh, sent off to Microsoft, which you, of course, conveniently route to another server so that you can see who is reporting uh, mails. And then you can make a little uh, summary of that. So here you see uh, that um, in the middle of the night, the attacker starts sending a few mails. Then during uh, the night, until uh, 3 o'clock, you see mails being sent. It's not much, it's uh, maybe 60 mails, but it's just a sample. And you see also here, uh, automatically re reply. Some people have that, I'm out of office. You know, that's a, <laughs> a bad practice, but it happens. And uh, in the morning, you start seeing coming people coming, and they are clicking this button and seeing, no, this is spam. And you can, uh, from this, you can calculate how much people do actually click these these buttons. So you have a, a response versus how much is my spam run uh, estimated. Uh, so uh, if if this will keep on increasing, then you can uh, take measures for 60 mails. I don't think you should take any measures at the, that moment, but it could be it could be a lot worse. Uh, and that means that you have to really get to know what your users are doing and how you should respond to that. So that's a good sample of how to do that with, with Greylog.
um, from Greylog, you can uh, you can generate alerts, and these alerts they are in the form of email. So what you do is you make uh, an, 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 a mailbox, or it could be a mail server where the mails come in. And then you can have an incident response platform that you have to take actions on these alerts because that's not in in Greylog. Uh, so for that we use uh, the Hive. Uh, does anybody know the Hive? Yes. All right. Very good. So the Hive is uh, basically an incident response platform with uh, capabilities that will help the threat hunter a lot. Uh, so uh, what you can have the Hive do is watch the, mail the mailbox. It will automatically parse all these mails that are coming in and generate alerts from these. You can uh, say, for instance, like the spam run we had, it could be that 200 people said, OK, this is spam. And then you have 200 alerts in the Hive. So you can combine them into one investigation case and it will be very easy to uh, process the things that happen to it because uh, when it processes the mail it gets the attachment the link from the that was in the in the mail if there was any it will get the hosts IP addresses from the header uh, and all this information you can um, have as an observable inside the hive and if you have an observable, then you can say, OK, I want to right click this observable and use uh, Cortex, which is a, which is a companion uh, software, actually. And it will uh, take this work, this handwork away from you. So you don't have to go individually to virus total, check the IP, check the hash of the attachment or do anything. Uh, you just say this observable, I would like to run it through any of these there are, I think, 120 uh, analyzers right now that uh, you can attach to uh, popular APIs of, of external programs. You can also write your own API. If you have an, uh, your own inventory database in where you say, OK, this IP address, this is a testing or staging for this application, and this is uh, a, another a company which which provides me with uh, this appliance. Or this is the contact information for this machine. And uh, you can get this enrichment from Cortex. So this will make your threat hunting and what is actually going on in here very easy. OK, any questions for the Hive? Or the incident uh, response for that? No, very good. <coughs> um, so one thing about sizing, because uh, that was, I think, here. Yeah, not all, not all functions are in every sock, and not all sizes should have every function. So uh, this is a small uh, list uh, made to approximately provide the functions within your SOC to your company. Uh, and this all very much depends on what you're doing. If you if you have a company of 10 people, then when maybe one person uh, SOC is, is very appropriate. If you're in information security and you're with 10 people, then maybe you should have five people in the SOC. So maybe, uh, and of course, this should be related to the work that is being done on, on, uh, on the SOC. Um, I would like to go now maybe to uh, a very handy tool, which is uh, honeypotting. Does anybody use honeypots? Yes, you use honeypots. Very nice. This, I think, should be also a very good uh, measure or, or control within your, within your system. And there are also open source uh, solutions to that. I think that a lot of people that are managing uh, large companies, for instance, uh, the University of Maastricht has the same thing. They had um, obsolete 
servers or, or patches that could not be implemented for one reason or another. And um, I think a lot of companies have this, these problems, not because anybody wants to keep them uh, in this state, but it's there's no alternative or it's very hard to keep up or whatever reason there is. Uh, there is an option to uh, enforce, of course, that you can say, okay, you don't patch it or we cannot patch it, so we isolate it from the rest of the machines and then you also have a solution. But this is also very intensive, labor intensive to realize and maybe even for the business very hard to do. So what you can do is you can install a honeypot, which is in this case I've... Uh, there are of course a lot of options that you can use standalone uh, honeypots. Uh, for instance, a Raspberry Pi with something, but in this case, for old Windows production servers running uh, old services, you can use TCP Trigger. TCP Trigger is, um, is uh, uh, just like a service. It's running on your machine, single executable. It reads from the registry, some no, from a configuration file, some settings, and it does basically monitor the network on your network interface. There it will look at all the broadcast traffic and will say, hey, I see a new DHCP server. So this machine immediately becomes for you a sensor which, is, which has the option to, to monitor the particular subnet where it's in. And it also will spray out different uh, interesting looking names for, uh, for NetBIOS and, uh, and broadcasts. And if somebody replies with, with NetVein or, or with, um, what's the other, other popular tool? Responder. responder. Then they will say, okay, auto responder, then this will trigger, hey, somebody baited my, my name poisoning for, for this subnet. Uh, it will also, of course, detect if somebody connects to the ports you want to monitor. And then you should pick the most popular ports, database ports, remote desktop ports, and the servers which your machine is running at. Uh, when it detects something, it will just write to the Windows event log, which you can pick up with Graylog, or it will send a mail. Very, very simple, straightforward tool. I would highly recommend this. I've used it in production. It works excellent. Just place one in every subnet. This will be, uh, this will be something nobody expects. <laughs> um, there are also other <coughs> types of honeypots which you can use inside documents. Uh, does, ha does anybody know the tool uh, can Canary Tokens? Have you ever used it before? No? This is very interesting stuff. You can, uh, you can ask things which makes these, these uh, honeypots also as standalone units you can buy, but they also provide this as a service, which means that you can say, okay, I want a random Word document with, with a, an image link in it, when you click it, it will update the link. It will notify things, hey, somebody opened this document and you get a mail. So what you do here, you say, this is the name of the document, this is the email that I want to provide, and anywhere in the world this document gets opened with an internet connection, with the right settings, of course. <laughs> then you will get notified. So this is excellent to place on the network share named uh, all employee salaries for 2020 or uh, and this way you can get a real good insight of the people who are very nosy inside your your network which is I think also a highly underrated uh, uh, control which could be used a lot a lot more actually I have a very interesting <laughs> story uh, for this one because when I first used it it uh, I was I was I was amazed. I opened the document, uh, and uh, I I got uh, this alert, and I thought, okay, it's working, that's excellent. And then I got another alert, but now it it, it because it also logs the IP where it's coming from. It says, okay, now it's coming from from China. I said, uh, wait, wait, I just got this document. What in the world is happening here? Uh, and then I was I was uh, paranoid, of course. <laughs> so checking my machine, everything, and uh, trying to uh, 
to solve this, uh, this ridiculous thing. I, I also created other new documents with new things and it, it, all it would, would all uh, trigger. So finally I found out that uh, my antivirus was watching me, <laughs> sending it to their cloud and also visiting the link and then uh, I got the double notification. So <laughs> this is something uh, good to, uh, to experience. But actually I, I do think this will take you 10 minutes and it, it, can, it can give you that much more insight into your, your network and uh, maybe even uh, entice attackers to... Uh, make themselves uh, known or ring the bells as it were right anybody questions for this one yes uh, it was trend micro yes hold on yes it could be could be anywhere it, 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 it's not only China it, it was uh, it, it was a couple of other places as well I think that I must imagine they have a, a, a Quite a good uh, cloud around the uh, the globe China. to uh, to do that. Yeah, China. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Okay. For situational awareness, I think uh, this needs the l the least amount of uh, of uh, of open source, and everybody does this to s a certain degree already. So. I I was wondering, really struggling, how to how to make this one uh, available, because if you follow the news and you follow Twitter, you 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 get an you build you build your your eyes basically around internet, then you will start to see this uh, for yourself. But <coughs> um, there are sandboxing uh, online services if you don't want want to build them yourself. I've not included that. Uh, in here, because uh, if you build something like a small sock, then I think maintaining your own uh, sandbox environment is is uh, quite a challenge. Uh, but maybe uh, depends on the situation, I guess. But what is really interesting um, for the open source intelligence part is that you can you can do that yourself. Just look up how this works and and investigate your own company. Uh, some tools that work good for this is, uh, I think, Spiderfoot. Uh, they they combine a lot of online services, which includes DNS, registration of certificates. Uh, well, actually, basically, a lot of plugins. And if you m are missing a plugin, then you can submit your own Python plugin on how to collect information. Um, but there's also some other aspect, which is uh, I think underrated or becoming more popular uh, nowadays and that is watching your popular partner so if you have a company which is doing uh, very good intensive work with uh, uh, well you name it any company then you can monitor them as well as part of your awareness session you can mon monitor their certificates you can monitor their uh, information of course how much information or time you should spend on it depends but especially if you for instance have a sh have a cloud environment or um, you have a remote desktop sessions from from anywhere then you would really like to monitor that nothing is happening to that uh, part uh, and you can not only monitor that but also um, for instance, your own IP space on internet, is it blacklisted? There are lots of services for that to, to monitor, but also the IP spaces of others. So that's what uh, is good to highlight in here. So are there any questions for this, for, for the open source intelligence? No? Very good. All right. So basically, um, just a short summary, I guess, then, uh, which will say, okay, risk management, this will be nothing or simple risk or, or just your, your wiki uh, installation. If you've got vulnerability management you want to perform on your own assets, then, then OpenFAS is a solution, uh, or in combination with a couple of honeypots that makes up your, uh, your detection and uh, vulnerability uh, management. And if you want to have orchestration, 
uh, and automation. The hive will do most of, of that. Um, I've, I forgot to mention actually that in the hive you also have not only analyzer but also responders. You can say if an IP uh, is um, well a bad actor or an indicator of compromise for me, I can uh, send it to uh, the hive responder which can do anything you want. You can say I want to connect to my firewall, add it to the blacklist for uh, half an hour and then uh, well, we'll we'll not see that one again very soon, or maybe you do. Of course, responders is uh, or or activating responders uh, is a, a question of debate because it might trigger things you don't want, especially if if you can uh, if the attacker knows that this is happening and they want to block out some uh, some activity. I think I think responding automatic responding is also uh, a maturity feature. You should do that when you have everything else in place, as it were. For uh, for for yeah for training, you should uh, if you if you ever speak to somebody, I have a sock. What should I do for training? Well, make people go to CTFs. Make uh, make them go to conferences just like this because this is information sharing uh, and where you can get interesting knowledge. Um, you can also use the canaries to say, okay, this user is too nosy, they should follow my, uh, my, <laughs> my user awareness training or, or anything like that. Yeah, and there are of course open platforms where you can, where you can learn. Uh, well, that's basically that. And then again, working in a SOC, this is how it should look like from a time perspective again. So management, uh, about 20%, uh, and the rest basically, or you do analysis, or you do building, evaluating, making up new systems. Then for the mat maturity model, if you're, if you're starting out to build a SOC, then you first start by by collecting all these logs uh, of course this is um, focused on on starting the seam tool which is often the center of, of a sock this is uh, yeah what you can do basically if you have the seam uh, installed then you're going to build basic reports and from the reports from the dashboard you get a feeling of what's going on inside my network because if a lot of uh, people are not uh, well are not building the uh, the knowledge of their network what is happening inside if you have a company it could easily have 400 applications all communicating to test staging and production in different ways uh, hopefully not uh, combined but it could happen and you could, uh, this uh, SOC should have visibility in everything which happens inside the company. So that's how you build it. Then you start to, to build use cases. So for instance, you say, okay, so if everybody leaves my company at five, then I would definitely would not like to see a change in the domain admins group at six or something like this. So you can build your own use cases for things that happen inside uh, your network and then you start building even more alerts fine-tune your filters get more or less logging include even the database logging or, or on, a, on a higher level in the application logging uh, into your scene and uh, increase visibility okay that was about it are there any questions yes question into the box. Into the box. All right, like this. Uh, I have not seen anything about host-based uh, detection, uh, like um, something like Wazoo, or um, you have also commercial uh, variants. Uh. Yes. Well, uh, my vision on host-based uh, detection is first start with uh, collecting the logs of all the Windows machines, which means actually processing a lot of data and. I think the first next thing you do after you collect the logs uh, locally is install Sysmon. Sysmon, which is a Microsoft tool, uh, monitoring basically 
a lot of extra stuff inside your networks. What are the parameters of my PowerShell script? What are the uh, uh, what is what process spawned it from, and etc. So these, I think this will give you a lot, a lot of insight. And uh, file-based or host-based monitoring, I uh, do see as an option. Only I know that it it is a lot of maintenance and a lot of work. If you are a one-man SOC, then basically this almost never is uh, is something that you can consider. But if you do consider, then the things you mentioned is uh, is is very viable option, I guess. Uh, I've uh, yes, and all that all depends on your tuning because in my experience, you don't get uh, file monitoring, change detection monitoring on files and configuration in such a way that you can say, okay, I'll take this template, implement it. Wow, that's done. I'm getting one alert in a week. No. You get 500 alerts every day, every Microsoft patch, and and you keep tuning and tweaking this template, and then it w doesn't work for the other 500 servers. So this is, I think, in my experience, a lot of work. But if you have a larger SOC and you really depend on no files changing at all, or very critical, or some files, financial systems maybe, then this could be a very viable option. That does that ans answer your question? It does. Yes. Thanks. All right. Another question about yes. network security monitoring. Yes. Uh, do you have any tools you use? Um, yes. Uh, the tools. Recommendations? Yes. Well, basically, there are a couple of options to consider. For network monitoring, I would uh, I would recommend uh, Suricata, which has uh, the automatic uh, open uh, source uh, tool uh, repository. You can get a commercial subscription. Those to those rules are also very good, but uh, I think that is one of the the, the best ones uh, out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Snort. Did I sn Snort? <laughs> <laughs> they uh, they are of course uh, uh, also an option. Yeah, no no worries. So that does it answer your question as well? Yeah, it does. Yes. Yeah, because I I've also considered very slightly to do maybe user behavior monitoring on the network for some reason, uh, and there it, uh, there appears to be something from Microsoft which, which can do that uh, in a certain way, but I have no experience with that, so I, I cannot share it with you, actually. <laughs> so, And for uh, firewalling, uh, is this a different team that manages that, or do you also have open source uh, tools for that? Open source firewalls. Well, if you uh, want open source firewalls, I think they're also a very good option, and I think one of the best options is uh, PFSense, and uh, this is this is uh, uh, yeah. Well, it's it's a firewall which which you can buy also commercial support for. It's not only uh, I don't know exactly if it's open source, but you you can use it for free as in beer. <coughs> and you cannot commercially support it, so you can't have a service model around it, but you can have support for it. And it does everything that you can can imagine. It does it very well. And I know that uh, uh, the author of the podcast, the Security Now, what's his name, Gibson, he uses PFSense as well, based on FreeBSD. It is. I have a question. Uh, yes. Regarding the IDF. Throw the box. Throw the box. Yo. So I have a question regarding the intrusion detection systems. Yes. Um, network or host? A network. Network. Suricata like. Yes. Yes. Um, what are your tips and tricks and lessons learned if you were able to redesign and implement it again in a network? Um, how you would redesign? That's a, that's a difficult question. But uh, I would I would le lessons learned basically. Uh, lessons learned. Uh, don't monitor too much. Okay. Uh, uh, so be careful where you monitor. The, the, the first thing you monitor, just the first thing, is your outgoing internet traffic. That is, that's a good one to start with. Uh, the rest, I would like to basically... I, I, I'm somebody who really likes to get firewalling down onto, onto the uh, machine based to the server base, to the workstation, everything has a firewall now nowadays. And with uh, Active Directory, you can easily configure that. So if you really 
are strict in managing the firewall at, at that level. And there are also endpoint solutions, for instance, McAfee or, or other ones that have firewall rules within built them. So that will decrease your, your, uh, your uh, risk in, in that aspect. So where, you can, where I think you should not use it, uh, in the if you provide an open guest Wi-Fi part of your organization there, you should not use it there because you will get a lot of alerts and they will amount to nothing basically because they're kiddies and things and customers and uh, so you will be chasing chasing a lot of people <laughs> without really getting uh, getting anywhere. I do have an interesting story about uh, that uh, by, by the way, but I don't know if we have time so. Thanks. Yes. All right. Thanks. More questions. Uh, one part that I missed is because you mentioned Gaylog, which indexes everything when it comes in. Yes. I didn't hear anything about data modeling because if you want to compare logs between each other, if it is any different application regarding authentication, you can't really correlate anything if you don't use a consistent data model. Is there any standard you use yourself? Or uh, I've I found that uh, there are a couple of uh, products which uh, do that very well, and I also found that uh, in in some of the uh, themes I've used, I, I was more uh, I was losing a lot of time trying to get the data model correct, and then they upgraded the software version, and then I had to start over <laughs> again with the uh, so so this is I think. Uh, when, when you're an analyst and when you want to have access to the thing, you can find it, I think, quicker by doing uh, finding a lot of events first and then manually correlating them. Oh, that was this IP. Oh, that was th that. Because if you filter out and convert uh, stuff uh, or, or try to force it in data formats in a certain way, then s some information could get lost. So that's just what 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 my experience uh, experience is, and then again, I've also worked on on a theme uh, in which I was trying to get every application to co to consistently cohere to this data model, which uh, actually it didn't provide logs enough, or it didn't send any log when when a certain event was happening. So, yeah, I I my my feeling is that. Uh it could be uh, uh, valuable, but not in my experience. I'd rather work with the raw logging and uh, do depth investigations on the spot. All right. Sorry, uh, we're out of time. So oh, sorry. OK, everybody else that uh, would like to ask something can uh, see me after the, after the talk. Thank you very much.